by more than 1,000 residents um, that collated around five pillars. So transportation, behavior change, green spaces, energy, and buildings. And Toronto has shown that they can be a leader when they try. And we met our commitment of a 30% reduction of 1990 greenhouse le gas levels by 2020. So we've hit our first target. And in October, 2019, Toronto joined more than 800 cities across the world um, from 16 different countries that declared a climate emergency and said that we are going to work towards advancing our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets to be net zero by 2050. And so that means no longer burning fossil fuels. And over the last year, the city has been undertaking consultation and they're working on the net zero plan, which will come forward to council this year. So I'm very excited that we'll take that enormous step forward in developing an ambitious plan to be net zero. And as Toronto's um, being, you know, Canada's largest municipality, uh, we have an obligation to lead by example and to pilot technologies that smaller municipalities not can't necessarily do that and they don't have the financial means to do that. So we have purchased 60 fully electric buses from three manufacturers. And so that's important because we're testing how those manufacturers are, are um, uh, comply, how, how they're doing in winter, how these different buses and prototypes are doing in the winter. And so that's important data that we can share with other cities across Canada so that when they go to burn their, uh, to build their electric buses, uh, they know that they will work. Uh, we completed our first solar energy and storage project at a paramedic station. So uh, we have a Toronto paramedic station that has 20 solar panels on it, two Tesla power walls, and it's reduced their, in, their um, energy consumption by more than 30%. Um, this year, we're going to open our first net zero facility, and it's going to be an 18,000 square foot uh, child care center in Mount Dennis. And that's important that we show others that you can have a net zero building, and if uh, the city can do it, you can do it too. And uh, in my community in Scarborough Rouge Park, so close to all of you on the eastern edge of Scarborough, we're going to have our first micro transit pilot. Uh, this is a fully electric bus that uh, is autonomous. There's no driver, although there is someone on there for safety as they're testing. Uh, and it will pick residents up their home and bring them out to the GO train station. So trying to reduce the need for people to get into their cars. Uh, so we have a lot of pilots that are going on, um, but we need to do more faster if we want to be net zero by 2050. And certainly, no matter what we do at this point, I think we all know that we've started to hit that tipping point where we're seeing impacts of climate change and we'll continue to do so for some time. So it's important that we prepare for that. And that's gonna be hotter, wilder weather, which I don't know if that's good or not for gardens, maybe the water, um, but not, not, not necessarily the heat. Um, so the city has launched the resilience strategy, which charts out how we will adapt to climate change and prepare for that. And what's important about the plan is that it recognizes that the impacts of climate change are felt differently by everyone. Um, certainly farmers uh, are gonna feel it differently than residents and within residents, uh, when I grew up, I grew up in an apartment building in Scarborough. It was really hot in the summer. We didn't have air conditioning. So we would sleep on the balcony when it was really hot. Um, so people in buildings, you can imagine without air conditioning are gonna feel climate change a whole lot different than, than people that live in houses with air conditioning. And then in my home right now, um, while heat isn't our problem, our problem is actually flooding. And we've had our basement flood several times when there's extreme, extreme weather. So um, we recognize that, you know, this plan needs to have many different aspects so that we're protecting everybody from the impacts of climate change. And certainly, I think in the last year, we've also recognized that um, part of being resilient is not just being resilient to blackouts or being resilient to um, weather and flooding, but also being re more resilient to a pandemic. And so part of that, I think, is looking at how we invigorate and reuse our green space better. Because certainly through the last pandemic, we've seen that we could use more green space in the city. And as we closed restaurants, as we closed um, you know, movie theaters and other activities, the one thing we were allowed to do is to go outside and get fresh air. And so um, the city has the ravine strategy, which is looking to improve those green spaces and make them more accessible, improve the trail network. Um, and they're incredibly important because of the ecosystem services that they provide. And because you are all um, uh, gardeners, um, I, I'm sure you can appreciate this more than others that if you put a dollar value onto the functions that the ravines play, 
Um, so for filtering our water, for sequestering carbon, for protecting us from flooding, protecting us from erosion, if you put a dollar value on that, if we had to build that infrastructure instead of having that natural green infrastructure, it would be $822 million annually. And so we've neglected these green spaces um, and certainly every dollar we invest in them will have a big return on investment. Um, and the other things with the ravines we're looking at is to improve the trails. So in Scarborough specifically, there's the Meadow Way um, and there will be urban gardens through that. And then in the west end of the city will be the Loop Trail, which will be a 65 kilometer trail that goes through from west from the Dawn. And it's a circle that goes out through Tobacco and then comes back to the Dawn. Um, so, so the last thing I just want to end on is, is share some news about how we're supporting the next generation of leaders and climate leaders. Uh, Toronto has joined 13 other cities, um, including Montreal and Vancouver and here in Canada, as well as others across the, the world. Um, and this is in a, a great program called Women for Climate. So we have identified 12 applicants in Toronto with great project ideas. We've linked them up with mentors and they are now improving their projects and we'll be competing against each other. Um, and then we will be funding uh, the top project. And so this is just a really great initiative supporting youth that are trying to make an impact on climate change. And what's also important is that we're connecting them with a global network. And I was at a, a Women for Climate event uh, at, in Copenhagen at the C40 uh, City Summit. And I met the mayor of Freetown. Yvonne Aki Sawyer. And, you know, here's a woman that's in a completely different, you know, side of the planet. And um, in 2017, uh, they had a mudslide from the impacts of climate change that killed 1000 people in minutes. And this compelled her to run and to become mayor in Freetown. And she's launched a program there called Transform Freetown, which is their plan to combat climate change and to, um, to stabilize the slopes in the, in the city and protect them from the impacts of climate change. And they have a goal of planting 1 million trees a year. And uh, just for perspective, the city of Toronto, we plant 100,000 trees a year. So if Sierra Leone can, can do that, um, certainly we can do more in the city. And, and here I am 7,000 kilometers away being inspired by her. So, so that's why, networking events like that are important because they give us the opportunity to inspire each other, but also to recognize that the emissions we put out in the city of Toronto um, are causing climate change that's contributing to Freetown. It's contributing uh, globally. So this is a global problem. We're interconnected. Um, so I'm really excited by these 12 women and the ideas that they come forward. I'm happy to, to share those with you when their projects are finalized. Um, and then that was pretty much all that I wanted to, to share kind of at the outset. I was hoping that there might be lots of questions. I know the last time I was with some of the ladies in this group were at the, the uh, Canadian Federation for University Women and they had lots of questions. So I just wanted to leave lots of time, but make sure that I, I kind of touched on uh, what we're doing to decrease our grass emissions, um, how we're getting ready for those impacts and how we're inspiring leaders. So I will turn it over to, I don't know who's moderating, but I'm happy to answer questions.